was off sick for about six months. I couldn't function. Um, I didn't want to take the, you know, the regular MS medication injections and so on. Um, so I started researching what I could do. Found about LDN. Um, I went to my GP. My GP had never heard of it, but she agreed to look at the information that the LDN Research Trust had uh, produced. A couple of days later, she rang me back to say that she was happy for us to do this together and learn. She would learn from me. Um, and so she prescribed it. A couple of days later, I had the prescription. It took me a couple of days to pluck up the courage to actually take it. Within um, probably about three, four months, starting LDN, I was back at work. Um, went back in a phased return, which took me about two months to go back to full time. Um, so by the end of the, the year, um, I was back working full time, back having a busy life, back just being normal the way that I was before, um, completely turned my life around. And I still take it to this day, I'm still, still, you know, working, still doing all the things that I, that I do in my life. Um, I first became ill over 10 years ago when I first got uh, breast implants. Um, shortly after that, I started getting various health problems, um, viruses, flus, um, thyroid problems, toxoplasmosis, chronic fatigue. The list went on, um, just constantly ill all the time. Um, and I removed the implants two years ago. Both my knees swell up in March and I was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. Um, the doctors, the, the, the rheumatologist wanted to start me on methotextrate, which is a chemo drug, which I was not wanting to start on because it's not a very good drug at all. Um, so I decided to start on low dose naltrexone and it's definitely helped me, definitely. I don't feel tired anymore. Um, I don't always need the toilet all the time and have constant bladder irritation, that's gone. I had migraines, a lot of migraines, a lot of s something going on at the back of the kind of my, my head, it's always kind of like bad headaches. Um, that's gone, don't have that anymore either. Um, all my bloods are in the normal range for, for the rheumatoid arthritis and I've come off my thyroid medication just gave me my life back. I just feel like, uh, and I've lost weight as well, actually. Not that I was a big person, but I've definitely dropped like two, three dress sizes. So it's massively, it's just made me feel back like I was 10 years younger. Um, it's just helped me get well after the breast implants and just get that wee extra bit just to help me feel a lot, lot uh, more better in myself. If I hadn't found LDN, how I was then, I couldn't function. Um, I was sleeping pretty much all day, every day. I could barely walk. I would hardly left the house. Couldn't work, um, which made me feel really sad and really angry and upset about, you know, what the future held for me. Um, if I would end up in a wheelchair, if I would end up in a home. Um, And I'm not. Um, so I'm Courtney and I work for Clinic 158. My experience of LDN with patients has been phenomenal. I've only been there coming up for a year at Christmas time. And even just now, I'm completely amazed by the feedback that we get on a regular basis um, from patients with MS, celiac, depression, Cancer in particular is a big thing at the moment. I've had a lot of patients who've came to us from recent um, kind of referrals from consultants and things down in London who've referred patients to ourselves, which we're obviously very grateful for. Um, and patients just really like how efficient we are with our service. So recently I've had feedback from a patient in particular who said that they've, they've got their life back and just Personally, to have that feedback and work is uh, incredible. You go home with a smile on your face. Just having 
knowing that someone's got their, their life back and, and particularly they're going on holiday with their kids again, it, it's just fantastic. Um, our service is basically like you fill in your consent form, you, you provide your medical evidence and from there on it's just it's smooth sailing basically. So you'll get your consultation with one of our prescribers, they'll discuss all your medical records, your history, obviously if there's anything else they can advise on they'll do so but also thereafter we mail that same day with regards to payment for your consultation your LDN and if you were to get say a consultation on Tuesday you could probably have your LDN by the Friday. When the patients present to me in the clinic I look to see that they've had a diagnosis prior to the consultation of a, any condition which is being used um, which LDN has been used to treat. So that might be um, MS or fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, it might be Crohn's, any kind of autoimmune condition. Um, also down to things like dry eyes, migraine, a little bit more on the fringe, but there is some anecdotal evidence to say that LDN has been useful. Um, so really anything that I feel that they could benefit from taking LDN and where the risks are low and I also want to make sure that the patients aren't taking any medication that would interact with LDN. So that's really just opioid medication and any high dose steroids. Kind of medical conditions uh, that we, we deal with in general um, vary, but mostly autoimmune, fibromyalgia, ME, MS. Um, we also deal with patients who have psoriasis, cancer. Patients which I see in the clinic range from all ages. I've had uh, a, as young as children, I think um, was maybe nine or ten years old was the child that uh, um, came to the clinic and I did the consultation with their mum um, up to a, a lady in her 80s um, who I actually spoke to after three months I think of her starting LDN just to get some feedback. And again, she had a really dry mouth um, and her, one of her friends also had this and had used LDN for something else and noticed that her dry mouth had got much better by coincidence and was willing to try it. Um, and I was just interested because I thought that was quite unusual. Uh, and when I spoke to her after the three months, her speech was so much better because when I spoke to her the first time, she could barely speak because her mouth was so dry. Um, and she found that the LDN had a massive effect on that and that was really helpful to her um, so yeah a, a, a big range of patients. I've been uh, aware of LDN now for about 12 years or so and um, I found it a very helpful medication. I initially uh, started prescribing uh, LDN because uh, for example in patients with MS multiple sclerosis uh, there's very few types of treatment available uh, that seem to be helpful or therapeutic. And I n initially, I started prescribing LDN to see if it worked or not in a sort of supplementary way and was pleasantly surprised that it seemed to have quite a lot of benefits for MS patients. And then as time progressed, I noted that uh, other patients would inquire about low-dose naltrexone and find that I prescribe it or have prescribed it over the years uh, an awful lot for uh, a number of uh, medical conditions and find that most of the time I prescribe it um, and have prescribed it that the, the benefits uh, outweigh the, any uh, negative um, impacts. Most of the patients who have requested a consultation um, within the clinic have already done a huge amount of research um, online and through the LDN book. So most of the patients, I would say, are very well researched in LDN and they know exactly what they're, they're looking to speak to me about. Um, a few patients have some questions, which I'm always happy to answer, but I would say that on the whole, most of the patients combined with the research that they've done prior to the consultation and what I cover in the consultation are happy at the end that they've got all the information that they need to go ahead and start with LDN.
my involvement with the LDN Research Trust uh, was primarily started about 10 years ago, um, where I was approached by Stephen to see if I could provide a solid dose form for um, the provision of low-dose naltrexone for the patient population that they were um, developing. Um, and uh, I commissioned a number of um, different providers to uh, explore formulations. Um, we discussed the most appropriate and uh, uh, settled and we've been doing so ever since. The type of medical conditions I would consider LDN for would be any neurological conditions, primarily MS, but as one becomes more experienced with MS and speaks with other prescribers and other clinics throughout the world, uh, then and reads the research and literature, uh, one often looks at uh, other areas such as uh, anxiety, possibly depression, uh, arthritis, joint aches, joint pains, and so that one begins to build up a, an ever-increasing repertoire of uh, knowledge but also uh, experience with different conditions. Um, there are a, a, a singular group that have, um, I've found over the years, got a lot of benefit and that is the patients suffering from conditions like uh, fibromyalgia and um, post-viral fatigue, stroke, ME. Uh, these are conditions that modern medicine currently has very little to offer and LDN seems to help an awful lot of these uh, poor patients that really uh, have tried so many different other avenues of medical therapy but have found very little benefit from uh, most other types of treatments. The other thing that I found uh, helpful in observations with LDN is that it's not a it's important not to look at it just as a standalone medicine, but more in a combination with lifestyle um, things such as uh, exercise, good diet, uh, perhaps supplementing one's diet with uh, multivitamins if, if they are indicated, um, to consider things like vitamin D and other uh, vitamins, uh, perhaps the omega, uh, chemicals as well that are now becoming more uh, available and so that when one uh, uses it as a complementary or supplementary medication um, then it, and along with these life, lifestyle uh, alterations or manipulations of one's lifestyle then uh, it becomes a, quite a strong therapeutic tool obviously looking into things like smoking and alcohol consumption as well is, is a very important thing. I think that in terms of LDN, you know, we're using it at a very low dose. The licensed dose is almost 10 times the dose that we're using here and the risks even in that um, use are very low. So in our instance, we're using about 4.5 milligrams of maximum um, dose of naltrexone. The side effects are very low, the risks are very low and anecdotally, patients really, really benefit from LDN in a whole range of conditions where, such as chronic fatigue syndrome, for, for really no other medication helps. So a lot of the patients are willing to try anything and you know the, the risks are very low and a lot of these patients come back and say that it's the only thing that's helped. In the last few years, uh, myself and other prescribers have become quite aware of a uh, uh, CBD, which is uh, derived uh, ultimately from the, the cannabis plant, and this is becoming a, a far more uh, intriguing medical theme. Uh, and again, a lot of patients, uh, when they come to you uh, inquiring about uh, the likes of LDN, the, when one's taking a, a medical history, then you find that they a large number of them are on CBD and other medications as well. So it's important to take a, a full medical history as well as a, a full drug history um, while looking at the, the original reason for why the patient has come to uh, ask you for a prescription of LDN. So really the patients that I wouldn't be happy um, prescribing LDN for are patients who are taking regular opioid medications. 
So um, typically it tends to be a uh, higher strength cocodamol uh, or tramadol. Uh, most of the patients you don't find are on regular morphine or uh, oxycodone. Um, but for these patients, I think who are taking regular painkillers, don't appreciate, but obviously that is a contraindication with LDN. So I usually have a discussion with them around their use of the painkillers. And if it's regular, I, I do explain to them that LDN probably isn't suitable for them currently. A lot of patients are happy that they're willing to come off of their pain medications and convert over to LDN. And I ask them to request a consultation again in a couple of months when, they've, when that's happened. Um, and for the very few patients, I think maybe one or two, I've refused LDN because it, it, they're on such a high dose of opioid medication. But again, that, that's very few and far between. Most patients are just taking you know, occasional painkillers, such as cocodamol, and they're willing to stop the cocodamol and to try LDN instead. So another area that uh, I've been observing the, the medical therapy uh, over the years is the area of uh, using LDN in combination with CBD uh, whilst uh, supplementing uh, patients that are either suffering cancer from many different types of cancer and uh, using a combination of these two medications. Uh, presently we're, we look at a lot of the research by, by Dr Wei Lu and uh, Professor Doug Leash um, from St George's in London uh, a lot and uh, they seem to be leading lights in the combination of these two uh, drugs uh, as I said as a supplement and complementary to conventional uh, oncology treatment. Uh, th it appears that uh, a lot of the receptors uh, from the scientific point of view that uh, CBD um, appear to attach to in the body as it may be that the receptors that LDN also attach to in the body are the same or similar receptors. Clearly, uh, this is very exciting medical research work and I think it bodes well for the future. Presently, uh, LDN and CBD are perhaps seen as um, being slightly left field uh, as regards uh, oncology treatments. However, uh, a lot of patients obtain these medications from uh, many different sources and they often bring their information to their oncology um, specialists um, when requesting further treatment or therapy. Other conditions I've seen LDN being used for and have used it in the past with myself is uh, different pain conditions. And now that uh, CBD is also being prescribed uh, for quite a lot of different medical issues, the combination of LDN and CBD in uh, different pain conditions appear to be very helpful. They seem to be uh, synergistic, which is a medical word for uh, multiplicative, the, the actual benefit you get, not additive. So you by t using the two medications, uh, synergistically you get a, an even more powerful benefit. I always as a as a practitioner I'll always use LDN very much as a, a supplement to any uh, more conventional treatment and uh, advise the, my patient accordingly so that uh, and I usually caution um, any observations that let's just watch and wait and see how things develop and we always tend to start LDN low and slow. So by gently starting on a very low dose and then gently building up over a number of weeks or months, then patients get to see the benefits, hopefully, of, of the uh, effects of LDN. The other, the other area I've been, uh, over the years, marvelling at has been the benefit that LDN gives with conditions such as Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis and also irritable bowel uh, syndrome. Uh, there's been quite a lot of quite good and strong positive research about the benefits of LDN in this and what I have seen over the past few years, certainly in the last four or five years, is more and more specialists, very conventionally trained gastroenterologists using LDN 
uh, as a first line treatment. And that usually indicates to me that they don't necessarily have been converted to using LDN, but are aware of its benefits and will use it at, like they would use steroids or other uh, types of uh, treatment or forms of treatment. Uh, the, the whole area of research with Crohn's and inflammatory bowel disease is very interesting and uh, often from the clinic that I have uh, been part of, uh, we use LDN in often in sub sublingual form and that it seems to avoid uh, the whole gastrointestinal tract. So my first, uh, the first time I got involved with LDN was around about 2005. Um, I believe that was about a year after the Rodos Maltrexone Research Trust um, started working um, with Linda Elsgood. And uh, basically one day the phone rang and it was, um, it was a doctor that I'd known for years who said, um, I've got this, this strange request from a patient who has MS, who there's nothing else I can, I can give them. I really want to give them this. I've spoken to the, the health centre pharmacy and they don't know what to do. And I know you're a bit wacky, so do you think you can try and figure out what this is? There are providers, there's a number of ways in which you can actually make um, unlicensed medicines available. They can make by, made available by compounding and pharmacy in the UK. Um, or there are quasi organisations um, who are licensed by the medicines regulator, the MHRA, to be able to provide formulations specifically in accordance with um, uh, physicians' prescriptions for unlicensed medicines where they've indicated exactly what characteristics they're expecting. Um, and my role has been, I've run a number of organisations which have had those kind of facilities and capabilities and, uh, and that's essentially what I've been engaged in. What we've been doing is to try and get a consistent presentation of the product. So we've got a tremendous amount of experience now from a production perspective in um, the provision of low-dose naltrex and capsules um, of a variety of strengths. But what was important was to try and have a consistent presentation over time. And really, you can only achieve this with large-scale batch manufacture rather than individual preparations. And that means that patients, both across the board, are, uh, are having the same product. And so you can have a better parity of experience, perhaps. Um, but also, it's the same product that the patient uh, receives on each occasion. And another advantage of batch manufacture is that eventually it becomes more cost effective. And given a, a large proportion of the patients are private and uh, paying for these medicines themselves, then that's, that's pretty key that we have a cost effective therapy made available. Within kind of 20 minutes, I managed to get back to him and said, well, actually, yes, it's possible. We can get the stuff. We can actually do it here. I found a formula. Um, we spoke to people um, who we knew in Glasgow, uh, luckily, who were in formulations, who worked in the, the hospital formulations and, this, and specials laboratories, um, and were able to get something which was suitable for that particular one patient um, very, very quickly by the end of that day. There is a constraint from our perspective in that I can only make things which I'm asked to make, and that's where it has to begin and end. And in terms of describing what we make, uh, that's really in accordance with the physician's prescription, um, which originally would have been effectively a recipe. Um, but there is a little autonomy to make sure that you have the, the, you know, certain excipients in there. Uh, the excipients that we've chosen and been using now consistently for the last 10 years are the ones that I essentially the multidisciplinary team have conducted a, uh, their inquiries about and find most appropriate in terms of an outcome um, and also from a side effect profile perspective so that all of those unpleasant things are minimised. So one patient turned into 10, turned into 100 you know, bit of patients and and what it turned out was happening was that there was this huge movement building around about 2004-2005 of people in the UK taking low-dose naltrexone. But the way they were obtaining it that, at that point was basically from compounding pharmacies in America. And during, over the sort of next few months, you know, we realised quite quickly that that probably wasn't an ideal way to do it because it didn't really comply with the, the, the legislation in the UK because of the way it was being supplied, also because it was being done by a compounding pharmacy, um, really the quality wasn't necessarily assured. Certainly back then, um, it wasn't as carefully it wasn't as carefully looked at in America as it now is controlled. So there were concerns all across the board about about that. Unlike licensed medicines, where large pharma have a particular molecule and a presentation that has undergone rigorous 
controls and tests in trials. Um, unlicensed medicines um, are an almost unlimited portfolio of products. And so consequently the regulator approves certain manufacturers um, with a specialist MS capability to be able to produce products which are in response to these specific requests from physicians. Given the number of patients that we've got experience with that have been taking low dose naltrexone, um, it's a larger scale production that we can make. But essentially, the organisations and the facilities that we use are heavily regulated by the MHRA um, as quality organisations so that uh, they can be trusted to make exactly what it is uh, that's written on the tin, essentially. Um, the, the, the way that they produce this is consistent, the, the, the methods used are subject to fairly rigorous scrutiny by the regulator in terms of their protocols and there's two different, different elements of quality that are, that are heavily regulated. The first is GMP which is good manufacturing practice uh, and the second is GDP which is good distribution practice. One how you make something and the other how you get it to patients appropriately. And the way that we have a network effectively a managed access program available for uh, the users of Lotus Naltrexone is that we have a multidisciplinary team of prescribers supporting prescribers peer-to-peer, -peer, of pharmacists who are in close communication and liaison with those prescribers around the patients uh, who are then getting a consistent presentation from us for, for that patient population throughout the UK. Doctors and pharmacists in the UK would have no real oversight of LDN because it was coming in, in unmarked bags from America um, and going to either private doctors or clinics etc and then being handed to patients. So because of that mechanism no one really saw it but once we started to see that there was a supply chain that could be done in the UK People started asking on the NHS, you know, can I get this stuff? You know, can I take this? I've been getting it from America. So if we roll on a bit of time, um, you know, we just continued to do what we were doing um, and it gradually grew and grew and grew and went from, you know, what, 100 patients to 200 patients to 300 patients to 400 patients. Um, and at that time we thought, well, we actually, we need to, instead of me with a mortar and pestle, literally in the back of a shop, you know, grinding up ingredients and Standing there for hours, you know, we, we, we built a, a unit specifically to cater for the low-dose naltrexone liquid and we started to, to order batches, of large, large batches of machine-manufactured um, capsules. And that meant that we could get stability and standardisation and it meant that we knew exactly what it was going to look like and the presentation was always going to be the same. And that's where we decided that needed to have a name, which was, um, which was Lowtrex, so we've been using that for a long time. And that means that if someone writes a prescription on the NHS, and they specify low tracks that the price will be the price that, it, that it's, it has to be the same price that you pay privately. There have been a great number of challenges to the supply chain and that has come from everything from other companies seeing a commercial opportunity in, uh, in LDN trying to do basically buy up everything that exists in the market and store it in a warehouse until it goes off so that it, it, people just have to go to them. Um, for commercial reasons. Now, for example, if we were supplying LDN liquid at £10 or £20 at the time and the NHS was refunding you know, £500 for the same thing, you know, drug companies tend to want to get hold of that if they can. So that, that, was, that happened on a number of occasions where people tried to buy or, or remove you Naltrexone know, from the UK supply chain so that we would find what we were doing, a very low cost intervention our low cost supply chain was, was being threatened. The, the way that we're, we're, we're approved by the regulator to actually produce these medicines and present them means that there are a number of constraints in terms of what we can and cannot be involved in, in terms of not just the product itself, but the way that we talk about the product. Um, by definition, they have no marketing authority, so there would be no broadcast of efficacy or, um, or, or appropriateness for certain indications. That's certainly the preserve of the physician uh, who is having a much more intimate conversation with their patients. So that, that's a bit of a challenge to, to, to discuss. However, what we do do is we make sure that our supply chain is verified and that all actors within it are bona fide. And it's challenging for patients that are sometimes faced with now an international uh, opportunity to be able to procure products off the internet that uh, there are dairy things which can be falsified and it's important that the controls are in place to minimise patients' exposure to, to those sort of medicines. 
Uh, every product that we produce uh, is accompanied by a, a certificate which guarantees its quality or effectively indicates that we have made it so that it is what it says on the tin. Um, there's two types of certification that can be produced. The first is what we call a certificate of conformity, which is exactly that. This is exactly what it was supposed to be. We have made it to the formulation and to the way that it's been prescribed. The other is a, a certificate of analysis where we will uh, subject it to further lab assays, etc. And the significance there is that if you've made something only one at a time, then it's much more difficult to get a certificate of analysis because you can't afford to take some of the product away and punish it in the lab to find out exactly what's in it. Um, so the certificate of analysis is always the preferred, which you can only get with batch manufactured product. So talking about the changes that have been made, so we, we went from starting you know, 10, 10 plus years ago using a mortar and pestle and crushing up you know, little, uh, little small supplies of tablets that we could get in or, or actives that we could get in to having a full-blown manufacturing sort of area where we, we dispense you know, vast quantities of the liquid which is made in bulk using homogenizers and a very standard uh, process which has enabled us to actually have our liquids tested to be stable uh, and shown to be stable for over 12 months. So we actually used an independent laboratory to take um, the LDN liquids that we use from the majority of our patients and put them through accelerated testing and then standardised testing so that we were able to see that there was no degradation actually, even at room temperature. So that was a really important part because our regulator um, on a number of occasions has wanted to discuss with us you know, how we're managing this supply chain and how we're managing to uh, supply all of these patients with what is basically an unlicensed special at the prices that we're doing so and, and making sure that we're compliant with the law. In, in my eyes, LDN is, is, is probably one of the most widely prescribed medicines in people with multiple sclerosis. And in fact, if you look at the number of patients in the UK with MS and then you compare it to the number of patients that we know have had um, LDN, then you know it, it probably is the single most, you know, I'm not saying they take it all the time, but certainly they, they are there was a, a great similarity there. Current legislation means that um, manufacturers such as ourselves aren't able to face patients directly. Essentially, our role is to respond to dispensers' requirements, pharmacies' requirements, and physicians' prescriptions that they're, um, they're seeing presented. So it's entirely inappropriate for us to directly liaise and make product available for, for patients. There needs to be that multidisciplinary team involved, where there is a physician um, and uh, an associated prescriber or, um, and, and then dispenser of the, of the product. And what we find is very successful is that if you have a network of uh, folk that have got great experience in this product, then there tends to be much more peer-to-peer -peer communication. There tends to be an improvement in the shared knowledge along, uh, amongst those disciplines and the experience. And that works very well from a patient advocacy perspective as well, where um, patients that are all within the same group communicating with each other can describe the, 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 the conditions and successes that they've had. Ultimately, our relationship with um, with the LDN Research Trust and uh, with the the team that we've been involved in over the last ten or fifteen years, the aspiration is to try and get some good data, some good clinical trials, so that hopefully this product and molecule can be progressed to licensure. Uh, that's our ambition. I think so, since the first experiences were being reported of of, of, of of what appeared to be positive outcomes associated with treatment with lotus aldectin by Dr. Bill Hari. Um, there started to be um, certain pockets of prescribers in the UK who were quite independently sort of exploring therapy. Um, and gradually they've sort of come together and so it's almost like this community has, uh, has started to find each other and, and knowledge has been improved. Um, it, from a product perspective that makes things much, um, much better because we can face um, with a single product for, for that experience, um, a, a, an entire population. So you have much more consistency, you have a, a consistent presentation with a, with, with a consistent quality and consistent experience, which means it can be more responsive and get bigger patches. So we've gone from just having a, a liquid formulation to having liquids. We now have a multitude of different types of capsules. Uh, we have a sublingual uh, version which tries to bypass first pass metabolism, which is a little dropper that goes under your tongue. Um, we also then make a cream, um, and it's actually, for almost every indication for people, there seems to be some way to get LDN into them, 
that will make that will make sense. Well, I worked out that probably over the last ten years, about five to ten percent of active GPs have signed a prescription for um, have signed a prescription for LDN. Now that could be that's not necessarily initiation; that's potentially repeats. But with the, the number of um, different individual GNC numbers that have been recorded going through that uh, going through that system, it's quite remarkable. So it's gone from something that nobody knew about, so sort of to, to ten years later, probably most doctors have heard of it or have got a patient in the practice who has tried it or is on it.